government problem has been solved with government band-aid, which has been solved by government band-aid. So if you pull off government band-aid, you have three more broken band-aids underneath it that sometimes make things worse. The EPA was not meant to go out and, and harass Oregonians and, and murder o Oregonians. What you're inferring is, you know what? If we legalize heroin tomorrow, everybody's going to use heroin. How many people here would use heroin if it was legal? I bet nobody would put their hand, oh yeah, I need the government to take care of me. I don't want to use heroin, so I need these laws. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Logan for Liberty podcast. I'm coming at you from the Pacific Northwest, where the sun shines so bright, only to rain just a few hours later. Today, this is kind of an off-the-cuff podcast. Most of my podcasts are, if I'm being honest. That's why they are unfocused a lot of the times, because a lot of the times... This podcast is me trying to find my thoughts in real time. The podcast isn't live. I'm not able to go live until October 22nd because somebody false flagged one of my videos. This happened a while ago. And I tried to use the repeal process to get the copyright strike off of that video because the, co the copyright strike that was on that video was illegitimate, but it didn't matter. Therefore, I lost my live streaming privileges from one failed repeal. Nonetheless, it's still real time because it's unedited. It's live in the sense that it's recorded live and I don't go in and tweak anything. You hear every time I stutter. You hear every time I pause to think about my thoughts. You hear every word whisker. Which is vastly different from my more scripted videos where I pretty much write an essay for a script or vaguely do a rough draft and then record that and then do the editing and polish it up a little bit. But part of the reason why part of part of the reasons why I want to do this podcast live ish is because it's it's nice to give out my thoughts off the cuff, work through my thoughts. Through speech, of course, writing is very important. Just a quick update. I've been pretty busy lately. Not not this, like, excuse. I've been, you know, doing stuff busy. But I've been furthering my education. I have been taking math courses. I plan on, hopefully, in a few months, registering for computer science classes. Um, I want to get a bachelor's in computer science. That is something I am pretty good at. So I'm touching up on my math. I'm starting from algebra and I'm working my way up to calculus. Algebra is extremely easy for me. Um, <laughs> I didn't realize how easy it was for me, but I decided I might as well polish on everything. Therefore, I can make sure I'm ready. And I'm trying to save around $4,000 for the six-month term. And it's a competency-based program. So there's that going for me. That's my goal. That's hopefully what I want to do. I, I have noticed on a side note that um, practicing math, um, well, relearning math and problem solving, reading books and writing has really helped me uh, linear linearize. Is that a word? Has really helped me structure my thoughts in a linear way. I'm able to focus on what I'm talking about. I, I suffer from symptoms of ADHD. I don't know whether or not I believe ADHD is a real thing. Uh, I, I know people have symptoms of ADHD. It's mostly in boys. I don't know if it's an actual condition. If it is a condition and it's overprescribed, I'm not entirely sure. I've heard many arguments from it. It's not something I've researched. But there are a few things. Well, no. So I have... I really have a problem focusing on things that don't interest me or keep me stimulated. 
Um, some people say that it's because boys aren't meant to sit down for long periods of time. They like to interact with the world. And I see that as true. Also, um, some say that it's when, when you're forced to sit down as a young boy and you don't get to interact with the world like you want to as a young boy. I don't, I, I'm not a psychologist or a, 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 neuro, a neuroscientist or a biologist or anything like that. So th this is just me repeating the bullet points of what I've heard. The front part of your brain, I don't know what they're called, but it lacks proper development or it, it lags behind the rest of your brain when it's developing if you're a boy and you don't get to interact with the world. Also, some say it's just a disorder to where... It's a disorder where you don't get the proper amount of dopamine spikes when you are doing something productive. So most people who don't have ADHD or symptoms of ADHD, when they are doing a task, that whether or not it's extremely rewarding, but when they feel like they're being productive, they get a dopamine spike. I don't. And I, I can, you can kind of feel when you get a rush of dopamine in your brain, but it's hard for me to focus on a lot of things. So I decided, okay, well, I'm going to take the necessary steps to overcome this obstacle or find something that does keep me stimulated. And what I found was that mathematics, it keeps me stimulated. It, it keeps me focused. Yesterday, I, st I uh, studied for about six hours. And it was crazy. And it's helping me restructure my thoughts. I'm able to focus a lot easier. I'm able to think more clearly. It's amazing. I don't know if this is a placebo, but I just figured I'd share my thoughts with you about that and what's been going on. Uh, what was it that I wanted to talk about? Oh, I wanted to, so <laughs> here I am talking about how clear my thoughts are, how, how structured I am able to think now, how much clearer things have become. And yeah, I forget what I was supposed to talk about. No, what I want to talk about today is why I am anti-war. I'm taking a break from the news, I'm just reading stuff, working on my education, reading books, and doing math, but I figured I might as well do a podcast, plug in my microphone, turn on my computer, talk about why I am anti-war. It's going to be a fairly quick podcast because I think I can get my thoughts out pretty quickly, but I'll probably add some details in it to elaborate on why I am anti-war because it's not a small issue. <clears throat> so, first of all, I want to talk about, I, one of the reasons why I am anti-war is because there are consequences to war. Now, I don't mean just the, oh, well, people die consequences part of war, civilian deaths part of war. It's a little deeper than that. Like, that's probably one thing on the surface level, the civilian deaths or the fact that people are dying. And that, that is a huge issue, but that's almost kind of a, a surface level reason not to like war. That I, it, I'm anti-war because I've thought about it past that point. Because when you don't think past that point, I think it's easy for you to be influenced by the propaganda or by the heroism, the jingoistic language of supporting the veterans and defending the nation. So without getting, you know, into the politics of it, well, for now, I want to talk about the consequences of war. War has unbelievable consequences. One of these consequences, which one should I start with? Well, let's just talk about what war is. What, what is war really? I mean, war is, when you boil it down, it's really one nation justifying the killing of another nation or people of another nation for political reasons. So it's just one authority sanctioning one faction to kill another faction. 
So that goes into why war is fought. Why is war fought? Why do we fight wars? Well, there's plenty of reason, reasons. You can fight wars just for a display of dominance. You can fight wars to gain influence. Which means conquering a people, conquering geography, seizing control over resources of a certain country, war for oil. Of course, you can fight a war over ideological differences. Yeah, because uh, kind of like the Cold War. The Cold War was a was a nice mix of different reasons. It wasn't simply West, the West versus communism. It wasn't just capitalism versus communism or individual versus individualist versus collectivists. That's part of it. It just so happens that one side was more prone to communists, communism. But a lot of the countries that were anti-communism, they weren't really all that individualist. They were kind of authoritarian in their own sense. Now, the United States was never like the Soviet Union and is not like the Soviet Union. So for those conservative, for those American first, America first conservatives out there who think that anytime somebody criticizes American foreign policy that we're just blaming America, that is not the case. Simply what I am saying is, is that a lot of the anti-communist nations were also authoritarian. So I don't think it was a individualist capitalist versus communist. It was definitely more individualist versus communist, but the Cold War also had a little bit of uh, countries fighting proxy wars for influence. Who could build a world empire? And the two main dogs in the fight, the two factions going against each other were the United States and the Soviet Union. They fought a variety of proxy wars. The most notable for us Americans is the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and um, Afghanistan. That the, the, Those are the three main proxy wars that we can think of. The Russians and China supported North Korea. We, The United States, the American government... And the United Kingdom supported South Korea. Although that was more of a United Nations police action. It doesn't matter though. It was the kickoff of the Cold War. So, uh, wow, I don't want to shift this conversation into the Cold War. So let's get back on topic. So yeah, war could be fought for many reasons. Resources, control, geography, ideology, a mix it's generally not fought for just one reason. You can't forget special interests, too. Special interests also have a role to play in war. Lockheed Martin, they, they get government contracts because of war. So, so we, we talked about what war is and why war is fought. And so let's talk about the consequences of war. Now that we sort of have a... A prime foundation laid down for understanding what I'm talking about when I'm talking about war. And we understand why it's fought. What are the consequences of a war? Well, we could talk about the economic consequences. There's this sort of myth that the economy does well during war. Which to me is insane to think. That's a really uh, Keynesian argument. And what's pathetic is a lot of neocons support this notion that war is great for the economy. What the hell are you doing in the Republican Party that claims to like free market capitalism? Although we know that the Republican Party isn't 100% honest or 100% principled. Um, a lot of them claim to like capitalism and the free market, but they're not really supporters of capitalism or the free market. So, with that being said... It's insane to me that people think that confiscating the wealth of the working class, of businesses, and giving it to people to go fight a war somehow boosts the economy. The only people that this financially helps are the special interests. Lockheed Martin, for example. The, the weapons manufacturers that get these government contracts, they get 
all the money. And of course, any oil companies that count as special interests who get a claim to the oil because of American influence over, you know, oil. Those are the only people that benefit. Everybody else is getting fleeced. And it, it, it's based on this false percep perception that just spending money somehow increases the economy. The only thing that war increases is the GDP because you have to spend more money. And the GDP is calculated, or government spending is included in the GDP. So you could say, oh yeah, during wartime there's a GDP growth, but that doesn't mean anything. That's not a growth in production. The economy does well when you produce. Think of it this way. What if every single company decided to stop producing goods? Farmers decided they weren't going to sell milk, crop, or meat. What would happen? You'd probably starve. You wouldn't have energy to work. Your money kind of, it would inflate. It would be kind of worthless because there's less food. Therefore, prices would have to go up, devaluing your dollar. How is that good for an economy? Not only that, but the only way that we're able to fund these massive conflicts, even if the death toll isn't huge, the technology behind it is still massive. Drone warfare costs a lot of money to manufacture these drones, manufacture these bombs, use the energy, the fuel and electricity to fly these drones, to transport our troops, <clears throat> to expend bullets. It all costs money. The... The only way that you could support such a long occupation is if you have money. But the money ain't... So a lot of it's coming from the taxpayer. But the only way that you can afford such a long conflict is by printing money, creating the illusion that there is money in the economy. Printing money. That, that's how they pay for it in the short term. What happens in the long term? Well, you get inflation. This is what happens when countries go to war. Central banks print out money so the government can afford war. But then what happens is, is when all this money is in circulation, eventually prices go up because there's so much money in circulation that each dollar is worth less. And I've always found it really interesting that people would think that taking money away from producers and consumers and then giving it to people to shoot bullets to use resources somehow is beneficial to the economy. Don't get me wrong, there is one way I could maybe see war being beneficial to the economy and that's if you're conquering a resource rich nation and then you take those resources and you sell it. But we're not conquering nations in the sense of taking over a nation and running its government. I mean, we're trying to set up governments that are friendly to us. But as much as you know, people like to think... So while the wars in the Middle East were definitely influenced by oil, we're not over there for oil. We haven't gotten any oil. Gas prices are still going up. It's not working. And we haven't conquered Iraq. We haven't conquered Afghanistan. We don't own those nations. We occupy them. And by we, I mean the government. So I think I've blabbered on about that enough. What are the other consequences of war? Well, first of all, it destroys innocent people and individuals. It destroys families. Because every family, not every family, but a lot of families, they lose the people who are going over to fight these wars. They lose their fathers, they lose their brothers, they lose their, their husbands, their cousins, their uncles. Imagine a nuclear family, a mom and a dad and some kids, and then the father is sent to go fight a war. 
Imagine a pregnant wife whose husband is sent off to go fight a war. She's vulnerable alone. That's just a biological fact. A pregnant woman is vulnerable. Imagine a family that is not complete. That's dangerous. We, we all know the statistics of how probable it is growing up in a single parent household how that affects your outcome. Now, of course, you can argue, well, you know, it should really be about the individual. Yeah, yes, I agree. It's about the individual. An individual should be able to take matters into their own hands and make something out of their life. But the statistics show that the that being raised in a single parent household is a negative. It affects your outcome poorly. It increases your chances of failure because you're not being raised by a complete family. Not only that, but grandparents have to wonder, grandparents and parents have to wonder if their kids are going to die before them. Your, your day-to-day life is interrupted by thoughts of your family's well-being when they are over in another country fighting a war. Imagine what that does to a family. It destroys it. Now, what if they die? I was just talking about their absence for however long the war is going and for however long their tour is. What happens if they die? An eight-month pregnant woman's, a woman's husband dies. The father of three kids dies. Somebody's older brother dies. Somebody's cousin, somebody's uncle. Somebody dies. And that family forever is stained from war. A family is forever stained from the consequences of war. This action caused this degradation of a family. But what are families a part of? Families are a part of communities. What happens to communities when families are grieving? And it's not only families that grieve over the death of an individual. The community around them that knew that individual, that respected that individual, also grieve. Going about your day-to-day life, knowing that your neighbor is dead now. Or absent. But it all, the community also degrades, just like a family. Because you're taking these strong moral leaders, these moralistic leaders who establish some sort of foundation of cultural ethics for the rest of, or community ethics for the community to look up to. And then you send them over to war. You take the strong, pick them out, send them overseas, and you strip leaders away from communities. That's what war does. So what happens to a community when everybody's grieving and when the moral leaders are gone? Your system of ethics falls apart. Your community falls apart. But what what do communities together make up? They make up the social fabric. They make up the culture. So what happens if communities start degrading? Your social fabric also Also degrades. So, why wh- why is that a good thing? Or how come nobody thinks about those consequences when you're stripping away strong moral leaders that a family needs, that communities need? What happens if you if these moral leaders don't come back, or when they do come back, these strong individuals come back? Physically and mentally damaged. What does that do to the morale of a community? You can't have damaged people being... I mean, everybody's damaged. But you can't have an unfit person as somebody, as a leader. I mean, you can, but it typically doesn't work out that way. 
especially if you're mentally damaged, then you have a harder time thinking straight. And thinking straight and logically as a human being is hard enough, but add a little bit of mental damage, aka PTSD to it, it becomes even harder to think. It becomes even harder to rationalize things. It becomes even harder to lead. I'm not talking about leaders in the traditional sense of like kings. I'm talking about people that communities look up to for moral guidance. I'm talking about people who aren't afraid to take the first step or who aren't afraid to sacrifice a little bit for the well-being of other people or the people that are just genuinely good, that give out a good vibe, that generate an aura of respect, of morality. You pick these people out, send them off, the community suffers in their absence. The community suffers when they die. The community suffers if they survive and they come back physically or mentally damaged. And when they come back mentally or physically damaged, I don't want to sound insensitive, but they become a burden on the community. And I'm not using burden as a prerogative. Is it prerogative? I'm not using it in a negative way. I'm using about the actual definition. They become something that the community now has to work around or sacrifice a little bit in order to help these mentally and physically damaged people, which in a way is a setback. You're as strong as the weakest link. And I'm not saying these veterans that come back who are mentally damaged are weak, but it definitely doesn't help for a cohesive society. It's a negative thing. It negatively impacts your social cohesiveness. You know, strong individuals make strong families. Strong families make strong communities. Strong communities make strong nations, cultures, social fabrics, social cohesiveness. So you take these individuals and you either send them off to die, you take them away, or you send or you bring them back damaged mentally and physically it messes with families and messes with communities therefore overall affecting the social cohesiveness so what happens when these moral leaders are gone when these people these intelligent strong people are gone they're either absent or they die or they come back completely different and not for the better what happens who fills in the role People who generally aren't the most moralistic. People whose system of ethics is extremely negative. You don't want an un you don't want an immoral ethics. So who fills in the gap? The state does. The state fills in the gap. And this isn't some anti government tirade, don't don't take me wrong, just hear me out real quick. You take these strong moral leaders out of these communities and the only people, the only thing that the young or the youth or the average person has to look up to is the state. And if you are to abstract ideas from observing the state, what do you get? You learn that it's okay to steal from people. You learn that it's okay to use, to use violence to enforce your ideology. You learn that violence is okay. In order to accomplish your ends. Does the end justify the means? And if you're paying attention to the state. That's the only moral ethical leader that you have. Then yes. The ends justify the means. Th that, those are just the small consequences of war. Now we can talk about the morality of war. People killing other people on behalf of the state. I don't see that as a good thing. Innocent civilians dying. How about soldiers who are used as pawns to the state? These people that are used as political propaganda props. Especially when the soldiers come back wounded. And then we laud them for being heroes. What... Now, I'm not saying that these people don't deserve our respect. They certainly do. But lauding them as heroes isn't going to help them. Not only that, but when we laud these troops as heroes, the ones that come back injured, mentally and physically injured, 
then you can no longer talk about the immoral, the the unmoral act of war, the unjustified war. Because if you are criticizing the war as deemed unpatriotic, and you're basically saying that these injured troops were died or were injured in vain, that what they fought for was meaningless, and then you're called unpatriotic. It's so so bizarre, and it's so. It's, what's the word I'm looking for? It's disappointing. It's stressful to look at this. It, it takes me back. It knocks me off my feet logically. I'm disgruntled at our troops being used as political pawns to support the war state. Not all troops are heroes. Some definitely are, but look, let's say that they are heroes, okay? Is it morally justifiable to take somebody who signed up in the military to defend the rights of the people of the country and, of course, the country? You're defending liberty. But what happens when the war you're fighting doesn't defend liberty? You're taking these young, ideolo ideological, idealistic young men... And sending them over the seas to go fight a war. Telling them that you're doing it to defend your liberty. To defend your family's liberty. To defend your neighbor's liberty. To defend your country folk's liberty. To defend your country's liberty. But in reality, you're not fighting to defend your country's liberty. You're fighting to defend your, com your country's special interests. You're fighting to... Expand the influence of your government. Is that good? No, we, you shouldn't praise the troops for being pawns to the state. You should be pissed that they're using these young ideological, sorry, ideal, idealistic men who signed up to defend their country or who signed up for economic reasons. You should be mad that the government is using them as a means to justify the government's ends. They're using our troops, the ones who signed up to defend the country, our liberty, the ones who needed an, who needed a way out and therefore signed up for the military. They are being used and lied to, just like the rest of us are being lied to, to go fight a war that's unjustified. I'm anti-war because I think open dialogue is a better way to solve our problems juxtaposed to killing people. It's not You can't even compare the two of how effective and how moral they are. I think a civilized society should be able to talk to each other even if we disagree and we should find mutual benefit such as trade as an incentive not to go to war and kill people and send people to die. That is why I am anti-war.